All right, welcome to the September 19th, 2023 Aries Cloud Agent Python User Group meeting. Um, lots on the agenda today. Um, we are recording the call as per usual, and we'll um, post the results after, post the recording after along with the chat. Um, thanks to the Hyperledger folks for taking care of that, like Sean. Um, the uh, This meeting is held um, by the Linux Foundation and the Hyperledger Foundation. So the antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Let's all be good to one another. Um, for introductions and announcement, if anyone wants to introduce themselves new to the call, wants to talk about what they're doing in the community, let us know. Talk now, grab the mic, and jump in. All right. Um, from an announcements perspective, um, the Internet Identity Workshop is coming up October 10th to 12th. A number of people from BC Gov will be there, and a number of people, I'm sure, on this community call are going to be there. So um, registration is open, of course, long since, and hope to see you there. Um, the Hyperledger Member Summit is in San Francisco and Tokyo this year. Um, I'll be attending... Um, the Hyperledger Member Summit on um, the 23rd of October in San Francisco. Um, as well, um, the I, I guess the Linux Foundation uh, Member Summit is the 24th through the 26th in Monterey, California. So um, a few hours south of San Francisco. So that is also on. I'll add that and a link there. So um those are upcoming. Um, I know right now in Europe, the um, Rebooting Web of Trust is on. Uh, that meeting is happening now. And I've heard some things out of it. I've also heard um, uh, some interesting things, announcements coming out of the Open Wallet Foundation. So you might want to check out their press releases and so on that have come out. Um, any other announcements people have to share with the community? All right. On the agenda, we'll start with the release 10.0.10.2. Um, we are pending some final tests done before we release it. Um, so far, we have no reason not to proceed from RC0, which we've released to um, the final version of 0.10.2. Reminder that 0.10.2 is a um, patch release. So it does not include all of main but rather just two um, targeted um, issues that came up in uh, in the release um, uh, 0101. And so we're trying to get that pushed out. Um, there were side issues as a result of, of those issues in a couple of deployments, particularly in BC Gov. And so that's that final testing is what we're waiting on. I don't know if anyone has any status. I don't know if Wade is on the call, but has any status from that testing. Um, Daniel Bloom heads up that there was an issue raised last night um, with some additional testing in one of ours uh, that looks to be a possible that did resolution issue. Um, similar to the one that was found. So I don't know, I know it was on uh, 10 to RC0. So, so it was the very latest code from a, from a release perspective. So heads up on that issue. Cool, sounds good. Uh, um, okay, um, so my expectation is we'll hear today and the 0.10.2 will be published out. But as I say, we're still waiting final word on that. Um, okay, next topic was uh, a big PR that was published a week or so ago by Shar Howland, um, PR 2487, which is uh, about SD Jot. So I wanted to turn it over to uh, Shar to give uh, an overview of, of the work she's done and, and um, how that gets used in Akapai. Do you want to yeah, share? Absolutely. Uh, sure, I can screen share. Yeah, awesome. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. 
So just as a, a brief summary of JOTS, SD JOTS to start off with. Um, so SD JOTS define a way to selectively disclose individual elements of a JSON object used as the payload of a JWS structure. Um, I can send out a link to the spec as well here. Um, let's see. So this is an important privacy preserving feature for JOTS. Otherwise the receiver of an unencrypted JOT can view all of the claims within. Uh, one thing to note is that the issuer in this case decides which claims can be selectively disclosable. So the holder can only selectively disclose the claims that the issuer has designated as selectively disclosable. Um, so for the claims that the issuer has not designated as selectively disclosable, the issuer has no choice but to reveal those claims when they present the SD JOT. So if the holder wants to do a selective disclosure and only reveal some claims in their SD JOT, each claim in the payload is hashed so that the, so that the verifier can't view it. Um, here, I'll show this example as well from um, this example payload. Um, here's what the payload would look like with um, the claims hashed there and, and not visible to the, the issuer. And then for the claims that the holder would like to reveal, they include disclosures, which are the plain text claims corresponding to the hash claims in the payload. So these look like this. Um, the, the plain text is there with, um, if it's a, uh, a dictionary object, you have the key and the value. If it's an array object, you just have the value. Um, this is what the disclosure looks like. And this is what the hash of the disclosure looks like. And we can see that this uh, same hash appears in the payload. So when the, ish when the, the issuer um, or the, the verifier receives the JOT with the disclosures, they go through each disclosure and hash it to make sure that the result matches exactly one hashed claim in the payload. Um, and if it does, then they are convinced that the claim um, is in the original signed JOT, but then they can't view any of the other claims in the JOT that don't have a corresponding disclosure provided by the holder. So for now, uh, we're only invoking the SD JOTS method through the, through the admin API endpoints added in this PR. Um, so we have SD JOT sign, which uses the JOT sign method that was previously added in Akapai, and then there's SD JOT verify, um, which uses the SD which uses the the JOT verify method that was previously added in in Akapai, as you can see right there. Um, so for now, the admin API endpoints are the only place that we are calling into those methods, um, but that will expand in the future as additional support is added for issuance and verification. And let's see, I, I added some documentation as well in the PR. In this implementation, um, by default, all claims at all levels of the payload um, are by default selectively disclosable unless indicated by the issuer, uh, with the exception of the essential verification data like um, issued, uh, issued at, CNF, et cetera. Um, so if the issuer does not want a claim to be able to be selectively disclosable, for whatever reason, they have to um, explicitly provide a JSON path to that claim. Um, and I walk, walk you through how that works here as an issuer. The spec lays out three different options for how to handle nested structures. Um, so if you have, say, a, a dictionary, um, like for example, this address claim. One option is to just treat it as a block um, that can either be disclosed completely or not at all, not considering that there are individual subclaims. Um, and so in this case, um, if you were the issuer and you wanted to, to go with that option, um, you would not include address to be able to be selected to, to not be selectively disclosable because you do want that to be selectively disclosable, but all the subclaims within you need to include them because they're meant to be a block. Uh, structured JOT as well um, is another option. That is if you want address to always be visible, the, the outer claim to always be visible, but the subclaims to be individually disclosable. So here in the payload, you can see 
address, but within you can't view any of those unless they are included uh, with those disclosures. So in that case, if you're the issuer, you only want address itself to not be selectively disclosable. Uh, third option is a combination of the first two. If you want the holder to have maximum choice over their um, presentation, uh, they can either, either disclose address as a block or um, the individual elements. So here the, the payload looks the same as option one, um, but there are disclosures for address as a whole, as you can see here. Um, and there are also disclosures for each individual subclaim. So that gives you uh, the most options there. If you have a list as well, you can selectively disclose um, one or more elements of the list just by using indexing and, and splicing. So in terms of our, our plans for use, we are implementing this so that we can use it with OpenID for VCI protocols and take advantage of the DID resolution and, and secrets management from Akapai. Um, so yeah, that's my brief overview of the PR. Are there any questions? Hey, Shara, this is Kyle um, Robinson. Uh, I have a question about the um, issue we're deciding which uh, attributes are disclosable or not. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of some business example use cases where that's uh, a good thing to have an issuer decide that <clears throat> they're going to issue attribute data, but it, the holder cannot disclose it to anybody. Yeah. Um, so, so you're wondering why, why is it up yeah. to the issuer to determine, um, which, which are, are selectively disclosable? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that's probably more a question for the, the yeah. spec authors. I think it is um, too. Yeah. yeah. I, just thought, I wondered if you knew through your example. Uh, yeah. What... Yeah. Um, one, I, the the idea with um, making everything by default selectively disclosable is to to make make it a, a bit more um, easy easier to use the privacy preserving option and and make it yeah just easier to to go with the um, giving more more options for the the holder to selectively disclose but yeah it, it's a good question in terms of um, business applications great thank you. Um, I, I think one call might be, um, I'm not sure of this, but I seem to recall this from, from previous discussions was um, revocation information so that you might have to disclose um, the issuer might insist that revocation status be, or a way to get revocation can be, be disclosed. Um but then oh, a lot of options on the rest of the business data or something like that. I think there's, um, Sebastian yeah. has a good one as well. Expiry date would be a good one that we, we want to say, no matter what I want to, I want to um, present there or, or disclose, have the verifier, sorry, the holder disclose that. So right. there are, uh, yeah, that do make sense. Yeah, yeah, I was and... I was maybe wondering, and maybe I misunderstood it. Again, this is probably more for the the spec, but um, the difference between an issuer forcing attributes to be disclosed versus saying that they cannot disclose attributes. Um, so revocation data, I think, would be an example, Stephen, of something an issuer wants a holder to, forces the holder to disclose. Yeah. Right, so things just work, right? Same with expiry dates. I I was interpreting some of this as the issuer can also force the holder to never disclose. No, I don't think data. that's possible. Okay, okay. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I, think, I think I agree with you that this is intended to specify that what things cannot be disabled if you will by the holder it's mm. like if if this is going to be presented then this information must be provided and that okay. can be controlled by the by the issuer that's the way i understood it yeah i think that's right, right. thanks yeah so. and and in this implementation um 
the the issuer has has no choice in for for this the ISS um, IAT the expiration dates the NF um, those built in are always visible so the issuer can't even override that and make them able to be selectively disclosable. Okay. It's a good presentation. Um, Thank you. So um, you said you said something about um, uh, your intent to use this with uh, OpenID and to use Akapai for secrets management. Does that does that mean? Does that kind of coincide with the other thing about the issuance and verification not being part of this at this point? Because you're going to do that independently. Or is that, are those two things have nothing to do with each other and I'm kind of dreaming stuff up here? Um, I think those pieces are a bit independent, but I don't know if um, Daniel or Adam want to jump in on this um, question as well. Yeah, I can I can comment. So the, the intent with this first chunk of work was more or less just to have like the, the baseline, the crypto implemented. Um, so we could start building on top of it in, in different ways. It's already at a point where with the admin API endpoints, it is usable from the context of having, having a, a separate service that's implementing the OpenID for VCI protocols, and then just using Akapai for the signature and the verification over payloads received through OpenID for VCI or, or OpenID for VP protocols. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't, even though it's usable already in this state for that purpose in that way, uh, we don't in necessarily intend to only ever achieve that level of support for SDJOTS within Akapai. Uh, there's just a lot of spec work that needs to happen first in order to define attachment formats for the issue credential v2, present proof v2, and v3 versions of both protocols as well, I suppose, um, to do issuance and verification presentation of SDJOT VCs. Um, but yeah, this is just the foundational work uh, to start leading us in that direction so we can have that support in Akapai. Great, thank you. Cool, any other yeah, questions? I was gonna ask that exact question about, you know, is it, we, we need an RFC for basically JOT attachments to enable all that? Yeah. Okay, I was hoping that's what you were going to say. Um, have you ever, have you given any thought? I mean, one of the things that I've been um, meaning to look at, but never have, is when we looked at um, doing an on creds in open, in um, W3C JSON LD format, we found it was pretty easy to do. It's just moving data around. Um, do you think, does, you know, has anyone given any thought to whether, we can do the same in an on creds dash JWT, just like SD JWT. We can have um, AC jots, <laughs> if you will, and on creds jots um, in this with the same technique. The, the JWT format for VCs, um, I think it's unique from the JSON LD representation of credentials in the sense that yeah. like, there's, there's, like the fact that it's a JWT kind of implies a certain type of signature has been performed. Um, it's possible that we could uh, define a, a you know a new day, a JWT type for the signing algorithm, and then have the the attached signature um, be melded and and fit into a, a dot delineated thing, just like in JWTs. Um, it. it it doesn't fit quite as nicely as it does into a JSON LD object, I would say, but I, I think it's possible. Okay. Um, there must be though different signature types. Like you must be able to specify here's the signature and here's the type right. of the signature. Right. Yeah. So, so for instance, for our, our SDJOT implementation and the JWT implementation that we we um, got submitted to ACPI previously, um, by default, it's using EDDSA, so ED25519 signatures. Uh, right. because that's kind of our, our native crypto language, so to speak, uh, for the dids and, and keys owned by Akapai. Um, but yeah, it's also possible to do SECP 256K1 or, or uh, RSA signatures. Um, okay. But yeah, those are 
the the algorithms that are supported and and defined for JWTs is, uh, is something outlined by like the JWT spec itself, I think, um, or like the separate registry style thing. But yeah. So it's, it, I think it's possible for us again to uh, to define one of those signature types and uh, to serialize everything in a similar way to what we're doing with the anon creds in W3C format and cram it into a JWT. Um, at the same time, I, I think we might, um, I'm not sure how much value we would derive from having it be formatted as a JWT versus a JSON LD object. Uh, when I think a lot of the appeal of the JWT for others in the community is that it's simple and there's a, a well-known set of signatures and, and lots of libraries already out there available for uh, creating and, and verifying JWTs. Yeah, the main reason would be for enabling um, OpenID for VCs to use and on creds. That would be the big value. Yeah. Then, then you're simply using a jot. You're just using a jot with a signature that has an on creds capabilities. So the the OpenID for VCI protocol also defines a way to to transmit uh, JSON LD formatted credentials, but it's oh, okay. It's, the way the spec is defined, it's um, oh, it's strictly expecting linked data proof signatures. I think over those JSON LD objects, so there still might yeah. be some some spec work required. But it, the the general shape of JSON LD credentials is supported by OpenID for VCI. Okay, so the path would be to stick with W three C format JSON LD data integrity proofs, and use that with OpenID for VCs. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Char. That was excellent. Great work. Um, so the status of that PR is it's in, it's ready for review. Um, there's been at least one review done of it. We need um, others to review it. So really encourage people, um, developers, maintainers to take a look at that. Um, I know Andrew went through it yesterday, gave you a couple of comments. Daniel's gone through it. Um, would like to see a few more people and then let's get it merged. I guess one final comment on that is, uh, so we're depending on a library that was uh, published by the Open Wallet Foundation. Uh, that library is currently only available as a, a Git dependency, pulling it in from okay. Git. We, we have reached out to them to see if they're planning to publish it to Python Package Index. They said they are. Not sure when that's going to happen. So if we're okay with it being a Git dependency for a while and yeah. it becomes available, then we're good to merge. But uh, otherwise, that's happening eventually. Okay. And, and that just means we have to keep monitoring that and then do the upgrade as soon as possible after. Right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, next up, Hyperledger and Oncred's Rust and Akapai. Um, two things have happened since um, since our last meeting. Um, I'll hand it over to others, but I'll just highlight. Um, we do have a 02 Dev 1 um, release of an Oncred's RS, which includes the latest CL signatures. So I'm hoping that means um, they've actually um, changed the versioning and marked the version, but they haven't actually tagged and released 02 Dev 1. I'm not sure why the split. And I'm asking um, the developers there why they haven't done a release. I think they, I think Andrew said I could go ahead and do that, which I haven't done on that repository but but will if nobody else is moving um so i'll figure that out um but daniel i think that opens the way for you to merge that into the anon creds rs um, the main the changes made recently in main um to include the latest um cl signatures code so that can now be merged into the anon creds branch is that am i reading that right yes um 
Excellent. Yeah, so that with that release available, we'll be able to um, make the same set of changes that were made on the ND cred X side right. to the non creds uh, agnostic, ledger agnostic side. Yeah. Yeah. And so the tails file handling is the main place that happens that you no longer as an issuer need to have the tails file, uh, tails file available for issuing and revoking credentials. Instead, just the keys are passed in to the various uh, issuing and revoking um, routines. So that's good. Um, the other work done is what uh, Jason Sherman has been working on. Jason, are you there and want to talk about what you're up to? I am here. Uh, hey. Yeah. So um, based on all the work that Daniel did about putting, uh, getting um, a non-creds RS in place, we're just kind of filling in slowly, <laughs> unfortunately, filling in the gaps there. So we've got the, I think, and I previously mentioned this, that we've got the issue credential um, API and um, present proof API um, implemented using a non-creds in the background. So there would be no real changes to anybody programmatically using that. Um, but now it'll be a non-creds in the back end. And I've been slowly, very slowly working on the revocation API, which yeah. I just put in uh, some changes this morning, I think, which will knock that off um, sure. with a huge caveat that as part of deciding what to leave in the revocations API, we took out a lot of the maintenance slash repair kind of calls, <laughs> which <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> which came in really handy last week um, yeah. for a certain use case. So that we'll have to discuss later what we want to do with that is um, it's great to have everything automated and simple, but what do you do in such a case that things go awry? Um, anyway, there's still there's still quite a few tickets remaining around that. It's a it's a kind of a long term project, but uh, just knocking things down. So um, I think we will be getting into the stage where we're kind of um, addressing things like how are we going to do migrations and stuff like that is from an API perspective, other than those repair type endpoints that I just mentioned, I think we're looking pretty good. Um, and now it's on to kind of really fixing up the, at the lower levels, like how, how do we merge or move data from um, into a non-creds and stuff like that from existing systems and, and things. So. At least the, the ball's rolling anyway, so we're making awesome. progress. Um, just yeah, it uh, <laughs> for my tiny little brain, it was it's uh, quite complicated. So, but the um, a, a revocation is the hardest part. So getting past revocation, I thought when I when I saw your note yesterday and the couple of tweaks that Daniel suggested, which looked um, wouldn't be a, you know wouldn't be a big deal. Um, that that is a big milestone because revocation is where the changes happen the most in transitioning from um, CredX to um, a non-creds RS. So that's really good. Um, the second, oh, the one thing I wanted to ask you is rotate still uh, supported? So rotate came in after we spec'd all this stuff out. So okay. currently it's not, um, but I'll have to put it in a ticket again. We're going to have some kind yeah. of cleanups in here. Um, like I said, to, ad to address the um, manual repair stuff, I guess. And that should include rotate is uh, what we can do. So that is not in, but we will yeah. have to decide what we're doing with that whole kind of section. Um, so I can either do it or leave it as a separate ticket. I kind of want to close this. <laughs> this yeah, yeah. no, I agree. Now. That's a separate ticket. <laughs> rotate will be needed. I don't, yeah. I think we're okay without the others, but rotate will be needed. Yeah. So I'll add, I'll add that into our, into the project list yeah. um, just to make sure we don't miss that. Um, but yes, I noticed that that one actually wasn't in there because we started started this uh, project before we did the rotate. Yeah. So just so people are aware where the little story comes from, when I started this um, agenda, we talked about the 0.10.2 um, RC0 and the two patches that are in that from 10.1. Um, 
the where we discovered the problems in 10.1 were in uh, was in upgrading a dev environment um to uh to use 10.1 or to 10 uh, to use 10.1 and and sort of screwed up rotating some uh wound up screwing up a couple of revocation registries um so when we got 0102 rc0 and and we're able to properly do it we repaired that environment and um, in doing that we use the tools um, for repairing which is just the endpoints for manually manipulating a revocation registry those that's the first time I don't I think we've ever used the manual um methods Wade in fact found problems in the documentation because it had never actually been done so I'm I, I'm less concerned about those repair capabilities but rotate will be needed um so anyway that's that's the story behind both where we are with um 102 and and the revocation pieces Emiliano yeah I I kind of I agree but I would just um let, let's have a discussion like also maybe with Wade about their repair capabilities there yeah. are a few different scenarios also for other yeah uh, unsafe operations that we were discussing we should put in a way of yes. like getting out of trouble yes and um the un the main one is the ability to um have an operation that that takes effect in the wallet but doesn't take effect in the ledger correct and you wind up with a mismatch that's the big one we've got to uh, address yeah, yeah. Exactly. yep um as i say the the main thing for for jason right now is to get the core of it working and working in an automated way, the idea of adding additional um, tasks to add more capabilities is easy enough to do, um, is, uh, is, sorry, is the approach to do. Let's get the big picture working and then we can add additional features. All right, any questions on that progress? Okay, um, these two issues, I've briefly looked at this, but really haven't done anything, but I did. We we talked about defining the behavior, the proposed behavior, I believe. For, so these two PRs are um, changing the, uh, so currently there was an old behavior and a new behavior. The old behavior is the default. The new behavior is, um, uh invoked by adding two startup parameters dash dash emit and then either um you know https prefix or emit uh, media types these take effect the message is the message type prefix so it's just a string it's nothing more than a string it looks like a url but in fact it's just uses a, a string for matching um, this was changed years ago in the community and um, Akapai still defaults to the old way and everyone's got to have this um, um, flag in to use the new way. Um, media types is the same thing. The media types go into a did doc and um, uh, we should be using the updated, um, but we, but uh, not all implementations use the um, emit flag. They're just not aware of it. Um, so the proposed behavior, and I just wanted to review this with, with um, folks on the call, document what is there today, which is we default to the old and we have flags to the to emit the new behaviors. One, one flag for each of these two issues. We're going to change the default behavior to emit new as if the flags were always set. We're going to leave the existing flag so we don't error if the flags are used, but they effectively do nothing. We are not going to add a new flag to uh, enable the old behavior. Um, because, and, and the rationale for this, and this is what I wanted to check with the community is, the rationale for this is that because all of the known Aries implementations can accept the new prefix and can accept the new media types. 
there's not really a need to um, uh, allow for, uh, to require to enable the old behavior. It's been many, many versions that we've been allowing, accepting both, um, that we really don't need to go back. Um, anyone have experience on, on whether this is a problem? We're good with this. That's what I wanted to see, a thumbs up from Daniel. Anyone else? Good stuff. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, we'll go ahead with that one. Um, community happenings, um, I wanted to um, raise awareness of a Hyperledger Hyper Labs proposal that Mike Lauder has put forward called Agora. Um, link is in here. Um, what this is, is effectively all of the work that Mike did over the last couple of years um, in various communities related to um, what amounts to an OnCreds V2. So basically this would give access to open source code for um, building out uh, an OnCreds 2 from a pretty solid base. So we're starting to look at it. There was a few comments put in. I just, let's see. Um, I don't, uh, we've got other pending approvals and I'll ping them because I'd really like to get this merged. Uh, but what this does is really open the door for um, an OnCreds V2 work to start from not a, a scratch or from an OnCreds RS, but from a, um, a, a pretty solid foundation um, of existing code. So do take a look at that for those that are um, able to or interested in, and, and you'll hear more about this over time. I'm assuming this will be accepted. Um, the chair of the Technical Oversight Committee at Hyperledger has approved it, Tracy Kurt. We're looking for um, the remaining lab stewards, as they're called, Hyperledger lab stewards, to um, a agree on this one and then we'll move it forward questions or comments on that okay um did peer progress and discussion um our developer on this um jason syrotuck has been off for a week and also has some other work has to get done so we're sort of paused on on where we are with did peer but in the community um, there is a PR been published that I'm hoping gets merged soon to the did peer spec that outlines the, um, the did, uh, uh did peer four method. Um, and then there's a reference implementation, um, that, uh, Daniel Bloom has implemented that's available. So this is, um, pretty great stuff. The, I think it's a, Compared to all of, <laughs> compared to the other did methods, I think uh, super clever thinking from Daniel and Sam on this um, compliments to you on really just looking at what's been done, looking at the implementation, looking at the effort and saying this, there's, there's a far easier way to do this. So that is great stuff. Um, and then the rotate did PR in Aries RFC has been added um, by Sam. Uh, it's been reviewed by a few. Um, we do need some a little more community look, but I imagine by uh, tomorrow's Aries working group meeting, it might well be ready to go. Um, and then Daniel has put a work in progress. Daniel Bloom has put a work in progress into Akapai to um, implement the new protocol, which is awesome. Um, Daniel, do you have any comments on that? What what you experienced and Thoughts on it? Um, overall, things went pretty smoothly with the implementation. Uh, I I had only a couple of minor suggestions of some additional error codes uh, in the event that you resolved the did, but were unable to find anything that enabled did communication within the resolved document. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was the only thing 
that I, I provided some feedback on back to the protocol upstream. Um, so in terms of protocol, I, uh, and kind of my main goal with doing an early implementation was to feel out the protocol and make sure that there is no unexpected like exactly gotchas. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think that turned out pretty well. Um, from the Akify side, there were some considerations uh, in terms of like caching the connection targets and uh, how we go about invalidating that cache in a way that will actually propagate across the cluster when you're right. Um, yeah. Anyways, so there's I put a bunch of detail in in the work in progress PR if anybody's interested in that discussion. But yeah, overall went pretty smoothly. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. It's really important to get um, implementation experience in parallel with um, with protocol definition. We've really found that over the years when we get on our high horse and implement a define a protocol without actually having developers build it and have to go through what the spec says we get into problems and so that work you did this week was was key yeah absolutely excellent um aath um test is still failing um because of the poetry commit um we've narrowed it down to um aath terminates the um, Akapai instance and then restarts it between tests and it's on the terminate that it's failing. Um, we just don't know why yet. So we've narrowed it down. We did find um, switching to Asgar made it, uh, gave out more information and we should have switched to Asgar long ago in AATH. So that will happen um, very soon. Um, but in the meantime, this is still an issue. So um, I, I'm, I'm got to figure out how we can make progress on this one. Um, uh, Ian Costanzo uh, did take a look at it and, um, you know, basically came up with that same evaluation, but not clear on why that restart um, is the issue. Jason? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, that I, I haven't been really been looking at it because I've been trying to concentrate on wrapping up this, but maybe after this PR is complete, okay. I can hop over there and spend some time. Yeah, I just yeah. My head was completely somewhere else, and that's why I wasn't really looking in at it. Yeah. If it's we stuck, had Gavin look at it. Unfortunately, both Gavin and um, Ian struggled to get their environment running the test, which is weird. I, I was able to run them trivially yeah. <laughs> we'll see if i have the same issue i guess as always i'm a little worried you're going to have the same problem ian yeah. did get it to work um i'm not sure if it was windows environment related i know gavin was on windows um and using wsl um but yeah yeah so i think yeah after, after this pr I'll, I'll maybe i can just take a break from a non-creds for a second and uh, hop in on yeah. Yeah. there. So, yeah. Um, Ian's suggestion, just so you know, was simply to um, change AATH, uh, the, the um, Akapai back channel to use poetry instead of PIP. And wasn't clear why that would make a difference. So it's not a, <laughs> not a great suggestion, but it isn't yeah. a bad suggestion either. I, I like at, that. Uh, yeah. What was that? I just said it's something to look at anyway, so that's yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, queuing something up for discussion. Yes, go for it. Um, uh, this is did key. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. There, there is one other issue. I was going to see if I could grab here real fast. Um, it's not jumping out at me in the issues list though. Um, yeah. Um, okay, uh, I'll just describe the other issue. So this one is, um, so we, we recently added support for being able to publish endpoint information from ACPI when there's a mediator in front of ACPI so that the service endpoint is properly set to the mediator's endpoint and then also have routing keys included. Uh, recently came to our attention that uh, we're still putting base 58 encoded keys instead of did keys in that value that we're publishing to the ledger. 
Um, and then a, a, a related issue um, is uh, uh, in the mediation grant webhook that is getting published to controllers. Um, the routing keys uh, published in that webhook are base 58 encoded instead of div keys. Um, and that's not because they weren't sent as div key from the, the mediator. It's because we're storing them into our wallet in the route records and in the mediation records as phase 58 encoded values instead of div keys. And that was, yeah. uh, that was kind of a transitionary step from what we were doing previously to um, supporting div key within the protocols. Um, but now we're, we're running into the limitations of doing that partial like normalizing to base 58 and then storing it as base 58. So to minimize code changes, but yeah, we're, we're coming back to that. Um, and, and we're working on adjusting things so that we're storing did keys, uh, which means that we'll be able to publish did keys as well as report did keys in, in the webhooks. Um, I actually had, uh, so Alex on my team has an, a draft PR that we're working on, um, it's on NDCO's fork of Actify right now. So I'll just drop a link to it in the agenda. Um, there it is. Um, and it's basically just going through and just swapping up the normalization and still accepting base 58 encoded keys for continued backward compatibility. But instead of normalizing did keys back to base 58, we're normalizing base 58 to did keys. Um, and then making sure that we're always interacting with and storing did key values instead of the base 58. Um, okay. The one challenge that we're actually experiencing right now and, and the question I wanted to raise was, um, I think it makes sense for us to, uh, for the sake of not having, you know, Band-Aid code around for the rest of forever, it makes sense for us to go through probably an upgrade step to update okay. the old records within the wallet. Yep. Um, to modify those values to be did key instead of base 58. Um, so when we pull those values out of the wallet, we can expect them to be did key instead of, you know, having a translation step every time. Um, so we were, we were going through the upgrade process and trying to peel that apart, see where the right spot was to, to like insert that logic in. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a like resave records routine that's that's built in and then there's also like a, a define your own executable route as well within the upgrades yeah yep. um is there like strong feelings on on which way is the right way for that it, it seemed like with the resave records we would have to do that translation always in the record itself anyways because it, to have the resave actually have any effect we would need to deserialize from base 58 to did key and then serialize back to did key. And so that band-aid code that I was hoping to avoid actually ends up sticking around in that scenario still. Okay. So you're saying the script right now calls resave and yeah, but then it, we'd have that in resave always. Right. So when we, when we hydrate uh, like a route record or a mediation yeah. record, um, we would always have to perform a conversion from base 58 to did key. Um, and, and then on the resave routine, when it saves it back out, it dehydrates again. And, and when it de dehydrates that time, it'll store it out as did key. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hoping, and maybe this is a vain hope, I guess, but I'm hoping to be able to not have to worry about anticipating values to come back as base 58 values and always having to do that check within the route record or the mediation record for the rest of forever. So you're saying in the update script, have it read in a record, do the transformation in the update script, yeah. save it so that the the load and save doesn't have to think about it. It just gets the right. right. Yeah, so that, that would mean that we would write one of those custom executable uh, routines in the upgrade script that would be filed away under the the uh, upgradable mm -hmm. things for the rest of forever, but I, I'm not sure if that is the right approach. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of hoping Chanjat would have 
thoughts or opinions on on how we should go about implementing this for the upgrade since I know Sean Jett's been involved there. Uh, so if I understood it correctly, simply resaving a particular record type won't uh, won't solve the issue. Like you have to have a custom, uh, like a, a conditional to check that out and verify that. Right. Uh, to make some manipulation. Okay. So in that case, I think exe uh, like the custom executable is the way to do okay. that. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. I appreciate your. So so with that. You would basically do an inv invocation of it. You'd start up Akapai and say, fix the wallet. Is that yeah. how it would work? Right. Um, yeah. As an upgrade script since. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're saying we're now expecting that all route records, all mediation records will always have to key values in them. And in order to achieve that state, we go through the upgrade step to make sure that records on existing deployments that were stored prior to this change um, are consistent with our, our updated expectations for these values. How long have we handled did key in, in routing? Uh, for at least a year. Um, I okay. think it was. Uh, Good answer. Yeah. So it, we've accepted did key in the protocol in messages, uh, but we right. continue to store them out as base 58. Okay. Okay, good. I'll, I'll put in some notes into the thing for this one. That's great. Um, did you remember what your second issue was? Uh, I know what it is. I just I haven't spotted the the ticket oh. link yet. I'll see if I can uh, link that as well real fast. Wait, I, do you mean the ones I put in the chat? I put two separate issues there. Yeah, twenty three fifty seven is the other one. That's right. Yep. So this one was more a uh, there's an inconsistency between what the open API. Um, spec is defining as being expected to come back from uh, like the mediation record. It's, it's it's expecting it to be did key, but we're still emitting a routing key as a base 58 encoded value. As a base 58. Yeah. So this will be solved by the same correction. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, same root issue as the other issue. When we fix this, should we be putting a release out? Think about how to how to how the release coordination goes with this because I'm thinking we want to update the version because the version would right the trigger the upgrade step. would trigger trigger the upgrade. Hmm. Okay. I'll think about that. Okay, good. Um, we're almost done. I think that brings me to, um, I think, the next topic for two weeks from now that I think I, I, I plan, which is um, I, I think we are very close. You know, our, our goal was always with that 1.0 was going to be um, AIP2. And I think with these changes, we're pretty much there um with the exception of please act um and i believe the uh somebody um there's a possibility dsr um has a has a new developer that was going to work on that um as a as a startup task so they were looking at that um i'd like to use that in, in two weeks from now to go over um the checklist of things we would need for a 1.0 release. Um, so I, I will plan that if anyone has thoughts and ideas on what that would mean. This sort of ties to the long-term support and the um, conversations that was had at the last ACAPUG, ACAPUG and at last week's Aries working group call. 
So um, I will plan that for um, our our next Acapug meeting two weeks from now. And with that, we'll wrap up. Anyone have any other comments they wanted to raise before we close? Uh, one final request. So you mentioned on the 0102 um, RC0 that you're having some resolution issues. Um, I would not mind being tagged in an issue. Absolutely. That. Yeah. Um, the message came up on internal chat last night and I've asked um, the developer to raise it and to flag you on it. So okay, cool. <laughs> you'll see That's it. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. None of uh, this is the first hint of anything related to to the actual resolution stuff. All of the other has to do with this revocation messing around and, and so on. So once we the revocation problems came about because of the the sort of the two issues that we've patched. Right. Um, but this is the first one that had a hint of that. So we'll take a look at that today. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thanks all. Have a great day. Have a great week. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.